thanks, Justin. I know that um, obesity is an odd topic to talk about at a strength and conditioning conference because nobody is here to learn how to eat more so they get fat. However, as you work your way up, as you become fitness professionals or, or, or doctors or nutritionists, um, as you begin to work with clients and patients or you're a teacher, you're going to be dealing with people who are extremely overweight. And the analogy that I've, that I've recently been making here, I'm looking around this room, how many people in this room have ever lost more than 10% of their body weight and kept it off? Deliberately lost more than 10%. One, two, three. In genetic terms, you all have won the lottery. You are the winners. You are at the far end of this distribution curve of people whose only concern with weight will be how you manipulate it for your athletic goals or your appearance goals. At the other end of this curve are a lot of people who are the opposite of the lottery winners. These are the ones who, through no fault of their own, have been or were born with propensity to gain weight very easily. They were born into an environment that is the word we use is obesogenic, which is like um, it's like being dry tinder in an environment with a lot of lightning. That's the challenge, that, and, and that's what my presentation is going to cover today, is the challenges that these people are up against. Now, all of us here who go into the fitness profession and those of us who are already in it have had to um, have had a lot of questions from people who are extremely overweight about how to do the things that we write about. And we have not experienced life as they have experienced it. And yet we're trying to help them, and we're, tr we're sincerely trying to help them. Um, but sometimes it becomes like, let's say somebody who just won the lottery, or somebody who just inherited a million dollars, comes to you and decides to give you financial advice. And your first thought is, what well, that lottery? <laughs> Why are you giving me financial advice? You can do anything to earn that money. And they're like, no, 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 I, I worked hard. I went to the store, I bought the lottery ticket, I researched which store to go to to buy that lottery ticket. I bought that lottery ticket faithfully and then I won the lottery. I earned all my money, therefore let me give you financial advice. <laughs> That is how uh, the fitness profession often approaches people who really struggle, severely obese, uh, the lifelong obese, the people who are really struggling with their weight, they, they're trying to do the right things. And it's not as simple as saying, well, just do what I do. Because what we do works, but in my lifetime, I've been writing about health and fitness for 22 years. Uh, I've, I've known most people, some of the people in this room, Mike and Cassandra, and. and uh, for, for several years, and the advice we've given has sometimes changed diametrically. Sometimes it's completely flipped from one extreme to another in the time that we've been writing about this. So that stuff worked, and then we go to opposite day and that stuff worked. Why did it work? Because for people who are at this end of the distribution, just about everything works. For people at this end of the distribution, yeah, not much works. So what I'm hoping is, that we can talk about the challenges that people face, talk about some simple strategies that can at least help them uh, get, get onto uh, a path toward getting some of the results they want with the understanding that they can never be us and we can never be them, but we can at least try to understand them if we're going to help them. Um, when I say why well, it's still hard to help people lose weight even when we know how to do it, when I say we know how to do it, which is we need to create an energy deficit. We need to create a calorie deficit, otherwise weight is not going to come off. Um, if you spend a lot of time on the internet, you see a lot of magical thinking that doesn't involve calorie reduction, but basically we're just, we're here, we're just talking about basic math. And I just say I'm a journalist, I'm not good at math, um, it, but, uh, but what, what we do uh, in our field, if we're not good at math, is we try to put together a story of, of the facts that, that we understand that can make sense to us. Um, and when it comes to weight loss, uh, it always comes back to a calorie deficit. That is the only one um, that makes sense. 
Uh, so today's goal is to talk about the state of the obesity epidemic, talk about what we're up against societally, talk about genetics uh, versus environment. This is something that uh, the lottery winners consistently misunderstand about the people who are at the opposite end of, the, of, of this distribution. Whoops, did that again. That thing never wants to go back. Oh, well, all right. Be more careful with my thumbs from now on. Okay, so let's just, let's just skip and go to how big is the problem that we're dealing with. So starting in the early 1960s, uh, those of you who have studied nutrition know this, uh, the U.S. government started the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey called NHANES. Mike referred to it briefly, but he flattered you by, by assuming you, would, you knew what NHANES was. I didn't know what it was. Somebody had to explain it to me, so I figured I'll play you. So here's where we are. We started doing this in the early 1960s. Average woman, uh, average woman in her 40s would have been about 5'4", 143 pounds. So by 2008, she's up to like 172 pounds. Now technically obesity is a body mass index of 30. So for a 5'4", inch woman, that's 175 pounds. So you see that we have gone from what would have been a, 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 a what we would consider a normal weight. We wouldn't, we wouldn't look at that person and think that uh, person's overweight. Up to there where we look at that person and say, okay, she's a chunky mummy there. <laughs> now what you see is by the time we get there, 2000s, now we're starting to level off. So something happened around 2002 uh, that seemed to put the brakes on what people, I mean, like I said, I've been writing about this for a long time. And when we were somewhere in this, uh, where's my little laser? Somewhere right around there, right around here, they're saying this is going to go on forever. And we're all going to be 900 pounds, you know, in, with, within a generation. And of course, it never works like that. Uh, it has leveled off there. Uh, American men, you see again, uh, let's say about five foot nine inches on average. Guys, like not even 170 pounds. So that's a kind of a lean dude by today's standards. Um, by the time you get all the way up there to the top, he's a little over 200 pounds. Uh, a 30 BMI, technically obese. That guy would be 5'9", about 205 pounds. So that guy is just, you would notice that that guy's, unless he's an athlete, power lifter, you would notice that that guy's pretty big. Interesting phenomenon is that uh, sometime between, you know, women were getting obese faster than men. Uh, they level off faster, now men have caught off. Uh, caught off. So basically all middle-aged adults, basically your parents' generation, on average, about 40% of them are, are uh, technically obese now, um, hasn't hit the population the same way. Uh, all, looking at all men, uh, 20 and over, you see the white guys right there, about a third obese, um, and, then, and then it gets higher for the, and then it gets higher for the minorities. Now look what happens with women. Look at that. So women, white women, about the same obesity rate. Now we look at, now we look at African American women, almost double. So again, this is, this is uh, like everything else here, this is unevenly distributed. Uh, this is what the cost is. Uh, we see that obesity is going to raise medical costs, even by 2005 standards, by about $2,700 per person. And there we're just talking about medical costs. We're not talking about the personal price that people are paying. That's just the out of, that's just out of pocket. <clears throat> the job promotions they're not getting because of their weight, because of how their weight is perceived. And this is, and this is actually worse for women uh, than for men. Um, the uh, the, the this huge... Basically, every 18-year-old male in the country, they can, they can look at these records. Um, starting with 1951, we were guys who were drafted into the Army in 1969. Going to 1983, these are guys who were drafted into the Army in 2001. So what they found, first off, they, you know, at least in Sweden, which is a more homogeneous population of people, you know, they all look like each other. They're all blonde and tall and beautiful. So um, probably they're not all beautiful, but, you know, just... Uh, so they, they start off with a higher estimate of what the body, uh, of what the heritability of body weight is. They start with like three quarters, so much higher than we assume here in the U.S. And they say that went up over the course of their study. The big one is a genetic variance increased. So that's the way that the environment acts upon the genes, or how the, uh, the, 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 the genetic expression that comes through uh, the environment. Almost this entire increase they see comes after, comes in the men born after 1973. So these are the ones who are growing up between 1973 and, uh, and 1991 when they're, when they're uh, drafted into the army. 
Um, so basically all the time that we would have had this more obesogenic environment. Their conclusion, and this is really important, this may be the mo among the most important things I, I say today, that the environment modifies gene expression related to body fatness in the direction of stronger genetic influences in a more obesogenic environment. So the worse our environment gets, the more fast food restaurants we have, the more highly engineered food is to get people to overeat it, the worse it's going to be for people who already have that propensity. How many of you have heard the phrase assertive mating? Maybe if you've taken a sociology class or an anthropology class, nobody's okay, great. Right? So this is all this is this this is all brand new. So there's two different types of assortative mating. There's what they call positive assortative mating, which is where people who are like each other find each other. And then there's negative assortative mating, which is what happens near closing time. <laughs> <laughs> I guess some of you will find that out. <laughs> so <laughs> we know that assortative mating happens by height. Taller people with taller people, shorter people with shorter people. We know that it happens by education, religion, and politics, that the most educated people end up with the most educated people. Conversely, least educated with least educated, and that seems to be accelerating as we go on. People are separating themselves socially more than they are, ever have before. Um, I can tell you that, uh, for example, growing up, um, my parents were married in, in 1952. Um, my uh, father was, really obese. I mean, he would walk into a room, didn't matter what room it was, he was always the fattest guy in the room. My mom was very slim, and she was like the most fat phobic person in the world, so how she ended up with him, good God. You know, I, I don't, <laughs> you know, it's like, maybe you guys all see Back to the Future, right? That is, I don't want to go back there. I, I, I have no interest in finding out how those two ended up with each other, because you couldn't have imagined a worse couple. So they have seven kids. <laughs> Five of my siblings have struggled with their weight. I haven't. So in terms of, you know, my parents' shitty gene pool, I won, you know, whatever lottery there was to win in that, in that I've never had to worry about my weight. And I've always been fitness conscious, partly because I got my mom's genes and it was a little bit easier for me, partly because I would look at my feet up like that. <laughs> so what do I do? So I marry a writer. Uh, I married somebody, I met her with graduate school for creative writing, so we're assorted in mating, right? By education, by interests, um, you know, both of us have, you know, families, you know, sort of uh, uh, on the leading side. So probably those of you in this room are going to end up with people who are like you, who are interested in fitness, um, who are, uh, who have a similar education. And that is uh, the way things are seem to be going forward. Now, the only question is then are people hooking up, uh, ending up with each other by uh, body mass index? So we go to this, uh, and this is a little bit complicated. The other stuff I'm going to talk about, this will be, I'll, it'll get less complicated as I go along. This is a hugely important point. This is a, a Danish study uh, talking about assortative mating by body mass index. And again, the Danes, you know, they're all like 6'2 and beautiful. So, you know, what they, but still, what, what, what obesity they have there, um, they are, people are sorting themselves out. Now, looking at this, okay, now the, I should say these bars aren't proportional. So you have these red bars here. So these are the women who are in the lowest 25th, up to the 25th percentile. And you see that you go all the way to the back with the men who are the, 95th percentile for weight. So the skinniest women, fattest men, some of them were still getting married back then, up to about 1970. And you see here that the biggest ones are finding each other to some extent. Now look what happens a generation later in the last 40 years. There is no chance, no chance that a skinny Danish woman is going to end up with a fat Danish man. <laughs> And in the U.S., probably odds are about like that. Look what happens over here. Almost double what you what you would get just by random sorting. Just people find each other, fall in love, love completely blind. Never been that way, but it was blinder uh, a couple <laughs> generations ago than it is now. Look at this. <laughs> the heaviest men, the heaviest women, far more likely to end up with each other than even the skinniest men and women down here, far more likely. 
And here's what the researchers conclude. Genetic predisposition toward gaining a lot of weight easily in both spouses predispose their offspring toward the same trait, but to a higher degree, to an exponential degree, than you get simply. So we're not talking about if you take a, a fat guy like my dad, skinny one like my mom, and somewhere, you know, we end up with a regression to the mean, right? So nobody has, nobody was as fat as my dad, nobody was as skinny as my mom. Uh, some of us struggle more with our weight than, than, than others. No, you take two people like my dad, you know, the female version of my dad, and, you know, they, that type of woman probably didn't even exist back then, um, put them together, and now you've got kids who are going to be even bigger than either, either one of them. So to sum up what we've talked about so far, um, obesity has increased most of the extremes. It's the most pronounced in minority yeah. women. Uh, greater cost to the individuals and to society and to the medical system. Greater impact of the environment on those who are already most predisposed to gain weight. And then assortative mating means we've got even more who are predisposed. Right? They want to look a certain way. Um, it's a number on a scale, it's fitting into uh, skinny jeans, it's getting down to a certain shape for a reunion. Um, it's something that is uh, what we would, what, you know, if we were judging them, we saw that's a pretty shallow goal, you know, you should be doing this for, you know, for your fitness and for your longevity. Nobody starts an exercise program or a diet program thinking about that. There's another kind of extrinsic motivation where somebody on the outside Doctor is saying to your, you know, your dad, man, you know, look at your, you know, your blood work, you're obese. You've got to start an exercise program. And he's like, okay, yeah, yeah, I'll do this just to get you all to shut up. That never lasts. Um, average person starting a new fitness program on January second. About seventy-five percent of those people are going to drop out before the year's out. Uh, half are going to drop out within a few months, and this applies to everybody. When they've studied prison populations, 75% of them drop out of the program. That's what they have to do. I mean, it's not like, oh man, if I, if I work out today, I'll miss a client appointment, and there goes, you know, my, you know, my chance to make partner. So, <laughs> they've got nothing else to do, and they still drop out, right? So what keeps people going? It's where the extrinsic motivations morph into intrinsic values. That is, it is important to you. It is important to you that you're somebody who works out. Most people will never enjoy working out. Uh, a psychologist, an exercise psychologist once told me that like 40, 70% of the population has what he would, um, forget the term he used, but basically they, they can't stand the, the discomfort of exercise. They're actually, you know, they're, they're discomfort intolerant. They don't like feeling uh, pushed. They don't like the feeling of, you know, just the, the heart rate going up and, the, and, and, you know, the breath gets ragged, they start to sweat, they don't like that feeling. It's like 70% of the population, right? So most people who are, even people who are in a gym working out, it's not necessarily that they like it, it's just it's important to them. It makes them feel something that they can't feel any other way. There's not a pill you can buy that's going to make you feel the way that you feel when you know that you have... When, when, when you train regularly and when you feel the effects of training. There's no drug that can replicate that. There's no, nobody can hypnotize you and make you feel like you're somebody who worked out. There's only one way to get that. So um, same, with the, you know, same with the diet program, same with the self-discipline from that. Um, when it becomes important to you, even if it's still tied into your appearance. For example, so many, how many of you are going to be fitness professionals or are fitness professionals or nutrition professionals, right? How many of you are in the business we're talking about, right? Virtually everybody. Except the cannibalism people over there. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> Our appearance matters, right? We take pride in it. It matters, right? Now, Tony and General Corbin talk about, you know, strength and shoulder stability and all that shit. He walks past a mirror with his shirt off, he's still like, <laughs> <laughs> So our extrinsic and intrinsic motivations, they still combine, and they're still valid on both sides. But that's why we do this, because it's important. There's also uh, some sort of pressure. Most of us either have or will end up um, with people who are like us, who are in our field, or who, or, who, or who take these things seriously. So, you know, we, um, 
if we're sorting ourselves out by that, we're going to continue doing that. We're not going to become something else. And finally, willpower. We know from a lot of research that if you can get yourself up in the morning to go to the gym before work or work out at lunch instead of doing what the other people are doing or work out afterwards or whatever it is, if you can discipline yourself to doing this, that willpower will tend to carry over to other parts of your life, especially diet. So, now, as fitness professionals, what can we do? How can we take this? What can we do with it? So, somebody decides they're gonna lose weight, they go to the internet, and that's what they're, that's what they're looking at, right? And I gotta say, I hear this all the time from, uh, from readers, from, you know, from my books, or from Men's Health Magazine, or people who just, who just find me randomly, they ask these questions, you know, it's like, man, I read the China study, so why should we do a vegan diet, right? How does that work? It's like, no. <laughs> if you want to do a vegan diet, or, you know, paleo diet, man, I read this book and it all makes perfect sense, so uh, obviously i got to stop eating grains, i got to stop doing dairy and all, that, all, all this. So there is so much confusing information out there, and yet, Without telling people they're wrong, without saying, well, you know, China study, yeah, boy, talk about some cherry picked bulbs. <laughs> you know, or the, or the paleo stuff is like, yeah, okay, so yeah, cavemen were perfectly adapted to their environment before, you know, before agriculture, so why do we find all their teeth showing that they went through long periods of starvation? Every single one of them. How perfectly adapted were they, right? Uh, all, you know, brains are bad, right? How come the longest lived people in the world have starch based, brain based diets? You know, everybody is full who says that there is only one way to do anything because there's a million ways to do things. And all good diets basically have a handful of things in common. This is a phrase I got from Alan Aragon, uh, nutritionist uh, whole or minimally processed foods. We know that our food environment has been manipulated to make the food. Uh, more palatable, which is less satiating, which means we eat more of it before we realize we've eaten anything. The only way to combat that is through whole or minimally processed foods. So, you know, granted it's going to take a little bit of preparation, but if you get people to eat foods that are as close to their natural state, where you could look at it and tell what that food was at, you know, at some point, uh, that's, that, that's what basically all these good diets are going to have in common, right? Um, I mean, there aren't many diets out there that are, that are based on junk food and supplements. I mean, they're, they're certainly, they all eventually try to market themselves that way, you know, like Atkins. I, I remember the moment they jumped the shark was, you know, they came out and they were like this, you know, the protein fat diet. They were trying to get you to stop eating carbs. So, um, so the moment they jumped the shark was when they started creating all these products like, you know, Atkins, you know, Atkins potato chips and Atkins salad dressings and all this stuff. It's like, if you want the diet to work, you got to stick with what it was, which is whole or minimally processed foods. Foods that are filling. What those mirrors are there for? You know, unless you're blocking the mirror, they're there to look at themselves. They're not looking at you. But still, there's a stereotype threat. They feel okay. I, I look different from everybody. Everybody's going to assume something about me. So that person is going to be very intimidated for no good reason because half the people who are thin have no idea what they're doing. Gym, right? I mean, you go to a commercial gym, three quarters of the people have no idea what they're doing, but a lot of them think they do. So you see this, uh, you see this a lot, I see it a lot. Um, you see this big middle aged guy comes into the gym, and you can tell just by the way he's dressed, by the way he's walking, by the deer in the headlights look. He hasn't been in a gym in like 10, 20 years. Somebody probably, his wife probably, doctor pressured him to go back, start working out again. He walks in and he sees all this equipment he's never seen before. And he's seen people doing exercises he's never seen before. And he has no idea what to do. So he sits down on the bench and he does bicep curls for 45 minutes because it's the one exercise he knows he can do that nobody's going to walk up and tell him he's doing it wrong. Right? What we can do is minimize the stereotype threat that kind of person feels. Help that person feel comfortable. Help them feel that they know what they're doing. Make sure it's a friendly environment, that it's a learning environment, that it's a growth environment, rather than an intimidating place where you are what you were when you walked in the door. What you were when you walked in the door doesn't matter. It's what you are when you walk out of the door, right? That's all that matters. Finally, this comes from um, uh, more psychological research at, uh, by, by Carol Dweck at Stanford University, and what she found with children 
was that when she, uh, she would give them a test, and then she would tell one group they did well because um, they're smart. And she'd tell another group they did well because they worked hard. And this was her, you know, first, her first big insight, was that then when she gave them a subsequent test, it was much harder. That the ones who had been told they were smart, they gave up really easily. Because as soon as there was a threat to their self-image, which may have been a brand new self-image, it was just planted in their head. As soon as they felt a threat to that, they shut down because it wasn't, it, it was a cognitive dissonance. Okay, now I, I wait, I'm smart, I should be able to do this. They pull back. The ones who were told that they were, they did well because they were hard workers, they're just like, okay, this looks tough. And they, perce they persevered much more. And so in her subsequent research, what she's done is she said that there's really like two different broad types of mindsets. There's a fixed mindset where people think that talent is innate, I'm either strong or I'm not. I'm either good at this or I'm not. I'm smart or I'm not. And then there's a growth mindset, which is I'm not there yet. I can get there eventually. There's a process. I just don't know what that process is yet. If we can, when we have a chance to work with people, whether it's hands-on, over the internet, uh, interacting with you know people in, in, in classrooms, whatever it may be, if we can emphasize that everyone goes through a process, that the key is how hard you work, that all the benefits we seek are not in our final appearance, our final number on the scale, it is in the effort we put out. That is what is going to improve our health, that's what's going to improve our cardiovascular parameters. It may not lead directly to weight loss, especially in the people who are going to struggle the most with that, but any improvement in physical activity, uh, any improvement in the quality of your diet is going to have a benefit, and the person who works for that benefit has every right to feel good about him or herself no matter what they end up looking like. They're not gonna, the, the people who are at this end of the distribution are never going to end up looking like you people in this room at this end of the distribution, but you can still help them get there. And that's a huge improvement for a lot of the people who aren't doing anything right now. And that's what I got. Any questions? Yes, sir. So there was...